Welcome to sections 4.1 and 4.2, where we're going to discuss cell division and how we control it. Uh, you might be able to tell that I sound a bit off because I'm sick, so we're just going to kind of roll with this. And I'm trying to make sure I get this in in case I can't actually talk in class. So starting off cell division is this idea of taking one parent cell, so this is especially important for unicellular things, and they will split to form two daughter cells. So this is our parent, and these are the two daughter cells that we produce. Now for unicellular organisms, this will be synonymous with reproduction. This is how they make more of themselves. Uh, with multicellular organisms like us, this will also be tied to other things like growth, repair if you have a cut, not just this idea of reproduction. So cell division usually will mean reproduction because so many organisms are tiny, single-celled ones, uh, but it doesn't always have to be, especially not for bigger organisms like us. It can have other purposes. Now the most simplistic version, the, the most archaic and earliest evolved one, uh, way of going about cell division was like the binary fission. Binary fission is about as simple as it gets. You have to make a copy of your DNA so that each new cell gets its own copy. So that's step one. Step two is you're going to typically attach this DNA and it makes it easier for prokaryotes because they just have one circular chromosome. So it's not like they have a uh, whole lot to deal with they have a pretty basic setup. So they'll take one of the circular chromosomes and kind of attach it to the cell membrane of one side, and they'll take the other one and attach it to the cell membrane of the other side. So in this way, they keep the DNA separate from each other on either side of the cell. At that point, they're gonna undergo cytokinesis, which just means dividing the cytoplasm. And so they're going to split the cell in two, either by building something down the center or by pinching it apart. Either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, the goal is that at the end you end up with two separate cells, each of which is half the size that it started with, but each of which still has the identical DNA. So we'll just call it identical DNA, whoops if I could spell, we'll just say clone because I can't spell well today. So it'll be a clone, same DNA, this will be asexual reproduction. We're not mixing anything up, we're saying this is what I have, this is what both of you now have to the daughter cells. Now, eukaryotes will have a similar system. It likely evolved from binary fission, but this one has extra steps. It's more complicated. This largely is because eukaryotes tend to have many linear chromosomes. So these ones you can see are like those bars you used to. So for instance, humans have 46 chromosomes in our normal cells. Uh, we're diploid. That means we have two sets of everything. So let's go through some terms. Uh, when you look at an organism, if you have one of each type of chromosome that you possess. We call that haploid, that's one set. So if you're talking about cards, this means that you'd have like a two, a three, a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace. So you have one of everything. Now if I were to go through and add a second set, so let's say you just had a two through an ace, and this was hearts, I now do the same thing and I can give you a two through an ace of what can I draw easily? Uh, we will do diamonds. There we go. Easy to draw. So now you have two complete sets. There's still twos, right? I've got two twos. I just have one that's the hearts, one that's the diamonds. So I have doubles of everything. That's essentially what diploid is. So in humans, we have 23 different types of chromosomes. So that's our haploid amount. That's what we'd have to have to have one of everything. But humans don't have one of everything. We get one of everything from mom, and we get one of everything from dad. So at the end, it's like we have two twos, two threes, two of everything, which means we have 46 total chromosomes. And that means we are diploid. That's our diploid amount. So our sex cells will be haploid. That's the ones that'll have 23, because they're going to go and get together with somebody else who's haploid, another sex cell. So this one could essentially be the sperm and then this one could essentially be the egg, and so they'll get together, and they'll give us 46, which is gonna be normal. That's our skin cells, that's our liver cells, that's pretty much every cell that's in our body aside from sperm and ovum or egg, whatever you wanna call it. So mitosis is cell division, it's asexual. The only difference, like I said, that we're gonna discuss here between it and binary fission is because it has many linear chromosomes, uh, it has to be fancier. It can't do it with a simple aversion, and so you'll see it has these fibers and such, and there's going to be more steps. It's not just like those three simple steps. You've got a lot of sub-steps that are involved. I'm not going to get into those yet, but I want you to realize that mitosis is a more complex version of binary fission. 
It has more steps that have to be done because it has more genetic material that needs to be handled. And so you've got some eukaryotes that can have hundreds of chromosomes. If you only have one chromosome, it's pretty easy to get them separated neatly and split reliably. But if I've got 200, it becomes very difficult to make sure that each side of this cell gets one of each of those 200, an exact copy, perfectly. And so that's why we're going to have some excess machinery, if you will, to make sure that this works. So understand your terminology, haploid, one set of chromosomes, diploid, two sets of chromosomes, and for humans, it's 23 is one set, 46 is the normal two sets that we possess. Now, for 4-2, the cell cycle is usually broken into two sections. So this is a cell starting out from when it first begins through when it divides, because up here at the end it's going to split so that we're going to get two cells. You know, one that's starting again in G1, one that's you know going to go do G1 as well, but separately. You know, it's going to do its own thing away from it. All right, so there's two big sections. There's interphase, which is gray. You can see that here. So interphase will have G1, that's gap 1, S, synthesis, and G2, gap 2. And then there's the mitotic phase, which will include mitosis, that's the M, and cytokinesis, that's C. Now, keep in mind, mitosis is going to be nuclear division. So this is where we divide up, if I can write, uh, it's where we're going to divide up all the DNA to make sure that at the end we can have two nuclei. So that one cell gets one, the other daughter cell gets the other. Exact copies. So that's what mitosis is doing, is divvying up the DNA. Cytokinesis, if you remember, is about splitting the cell. So cytokinesis, which is C, that one's going to be about kinesis, if I can write, even though it's horrible. That's going to be about going from this to this. Okay, So we're going to go from one cell to two cells that are half the size because we somehow broke it into or divided it. That's cytokinesis. Now in G1, this is going to be largely about growth, getting bigger, just kind of living. This is like a normal thing. When you get to S, that's going to be the synthesis phase. So this is going to be where we copy DNA. So we've kind of committed now that we're going to divide at some point, although it could be a ways off. But we've went through and copied our DNA in preparation. G2 is like the final prep phase where you make sure that you know your organelles are all aligned and you've got enough of them to supply two cells. Uh, you make sure that you're large enough so that you can go through and survive dividing because it will make you smaller. So if you did this too much, you could become too small to live. Uh, so you just make sure everything's taken care of because once you shift into the M phase, these M and C phases, the mitotic phase, are fairly brief. So you're going to go through this process of forming chromosomes, you know, divvying up the DNA, the chromosomes, and then splitting that cell fairly rapidly because we've talked about before when you have chromosomes that's condensed DNA and we can't use it very much. So we don't really want to stay in this M phase very long. This M phase is meant to be brief and then the vast majority of the cell's life, 90 plus percent, will be spent back in interphase, G1, S, and G2. Each of these can last quite a ways. It's not like G1 has to be almost all of interphase. Uh, each of these can take quite a while. Now, before we kind of let this go, with the cell cycle, there's certain points where we can kind of stop this process and make sure things are doing okay. There's the first one that's at G1, and this can actually shift a, gel in a cell into something called G0, which means you're not going to reproduce. So it'd be kind of like you before you had kids, like immediately once hitting adolescence, saying like, you know what I need? A vasectomy. And so you just shut the whole thing down where just as you had like the chance to reproduce perhaps, you shut it down immediately so there will never be reproduction. That's essentially G0. There's some things that might be able to make a cell move back and forth, but this is a fairly permanent, at least, way of saying, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to reproduce. Some of our cells, like nerve cells, can last a long time where they could be pretty much as old as you. They just don't reproduce. They just hang out. Now, assuming that you decide to move past G1, then you'll go to synthesis, and you'll get to G2, and there'll be a checkpoint there, which is the one that determines whether or not you start the M phase, mitosis and cytokinesis. So this is the one where you kind of wait for the go-ahead that, all right, we know you're ready, but we want you to reproduce. This helps prevent cells from reproducing uncontrollably because sometimes you might be ready, but we don't need more cells. You know, we're good. And so you don't want something bad to happen, like <clears throat> cancer. So you say, all right, you know, just wait there until you get the chemical signal that says we're ready. And that chemical signal could be 
uh, one that occurs just steadily over time as your skin cells replace the ones that are given away. It could be because of injury. Uh, could be because of growth signals that are given, like when you're growing as adolescents like you guys are. And then there's one last one that'll be in the middle of mitosis at a phase that we'll discuss later called metaphase. But there is one brief checkpoint that does occur within mitosis. And this one's kind of important because it occurs right before you actually divide the cell, cytokinesis. And, you know, basically it occurs when, as you're dividing up the DNA. So this one's the one that's trying to make sure everything's in order as you're divide, right before you divide up. So the metaphase checkpoint is going to be one that occurs right before we split the DNA, take it to either side of the cell, and divide the cell. So this one's important because it tries to make sure that we don't screw up and accidentally give a cell too many chromosomes or not enough chromosomes because we've talked about how those mutations tend to not end up well. And so this metaphase checkpoint is the one that's really just about trying to make sure that the DNA is prepped to be separated properly because if it doesn't get separated properly, bad things will oftentimes happen. Now, just as one final touch up, we did say that cancer was uncontrolled cell growth. But when people discuss cancer and study it, they study the cell cycle regulation. Because what cancer really does is it ignores all those checkpoints we just talked about. So those checkpoints that are supposed to happen at the end of G1, G2, and during mitosis, it just ignores them like it's deaf, and so it can't tell about the signals. And so people try to study it to try and figure out, this is a tumor, basically a mass of cancer cells, if there's a way in which they can turn some of those signals back on to make it start to follow directions again. Because if they could do that, it would stop being cancerous. Because the whole point of cancer is that it's doing too much reproduction, and then the other negative about cancer, of course, is it likes to travel throughout your body called metastasis. And so if these guys are ultimately soaking up nutrients and taking up space, that makes it impossible for our normal cells that have specific jobs to get them done. If we can go through and just figure out how to prevent those things, we could perhaps stop cancer in its tracks.